I know that we're all here gratefully and thankfully to praise God and honor His name, to worship with Jesus and with one another in this hour of fellowship. We sing songs of praise to God. We bow our heads in prayer. We open up the inspired word of God and study a portion of that to give us direction and encouragement to follow that direction throughout the coming week. So we're thankful that you're here and we're thankful for our visitors and invite you to come back anytime you have an opportunity to worship with us. Imagine for just a moment if you can, something that would be very odd and strange. It would even sound odd. It would be disconcerting and disappointing. It would even be tragic when you think about it. If at the end of every exhortation to follow him, to adopt a child of Christ-like virtue, or to become faithful, if after all of those admonitions Jesus said, but don't bother, trying because you really can't change your life. You can't be faithful. It's impossible for you to make a decision of faithfulness, to follow me. You really have no choice in the matter. So listen to what I have to say, but then just let it go in one ear and out the other because it doesn't really make any difference. My thoughts, my commands, my expectations are totally irrelevant, Jesus would say, because you can't apply them to your life anyway. If that were part of the scripture, then it would change virtually everything about Christ, everything about Christianity, everything about the gospel, the message of the gospel, and everything about our relationship to Christ. Such as Matthew chapter 5 and verse 16, where Jesus says, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. If Jesus uttered those words and then followed them up by saying, well, there's not going to be any light whatsoever in your life. That's impossible. You cannot perform any good works, and therefore nobody's going to be able to glorify God when they observe whatever you do. That will put a whole new light on everything and turn our thoughts and our minds away from the Word of God altogether. Or maybe over in Matthew chapter 11 and verse 28, where Jesus offers this tender invitation, Come unto me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And Jesus followed up that by saying, it's really not going to happen. You can't follow my example. There's nothing good about you. Uh, you can't relate to me and what I say. Uh, keep my commandments or take my yoke upon you. It's impossible. Look at chapter 13 of Matthew and verse 23. Where it says, But he who received on the good ground is he who hears the word and understands it. Who indeed bears fruit and produces some a hundredfold, some sixty, and some thirty. And Jesus followed that up by saying, Well, you can't do any good works anyway, so just forget it. It's useless. Don't even try to be good. Don't even try to hear the word, understand the word, and obey the word, and perform good works, and bear fruit for Christ, because it's really not going to happen. Or maybe a verse that's even more familiar with us in Acts chapter 2. And verse 36, when that multitude that were de uh, destroyed emotionally because they had been told they crucified the very Messiah. And they said, therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart. And they said to Peter, and the other apostles, men and brethren, what must we do? And then Peter's answer would be, nothing. Sorry, there's nothing you can do, so just turn sorrowfully and walk away. Well, there will be endless examples of situations like that, and words like that, throughout the entire New Testament, spoken either by Jesus or 
the apostles. And if we include, include all those admonitions to obedience with the context that you can't be obedient, and that would change everything, as I mentioned, about the Word of God. What we're talking about today is the free will of man with regard to salvation. Do we have free will? Do we have a choice in the matter? Do we have the opportunity to obey and actually put in practice the words of Jesus, the invitations of Jesus, the admonitions and the encouragement of Jesus? Or is it all going to fall on deaf ears when we're totally unable to apply what God wants us to do? I believe that free will has always been a key factor in man's relationship with God. Always has been and always will be. So we'll never be disappointed or disconcerted or it will never sound strange or odd that Jesus would follow up his admonitions with those words, don't worry about it, you can't obey anyway. Because God does expect us and encourages us. He gives us the right and the opportunity to obey, to make the right choice, and to do what God encourages us to do. Going back over to Joshua chapter 24, we read where Joshua had an opportunity to make a choice. And it says there in chapter 24 and verse 13, I have given you the land for which you did not labor, and cities which you did not build, and you dwell in them. You eat the divine vineyards and olive groves which you did not plant. Now therefore hear, fear the Lord, serve him in sincerity and in truth, and put away the gods which your fathers served on the other side of the river, and in Egypt serve the Lord. And if it seems evil to you to serve the Lord, Choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, whether the gods which your father served that were on the other side of the river, that is in Egypt, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Joshua, in his concluding words, after they had already been brought into the land of Canaan, the promised land, he gave an option to the people who said, You choose. For yourselves this day whom you will serve. Either the gods of the Amorites or the gods of the Egyptians or the Lord God who brought you into this great land. And then Joshua ended that brief discussion by saying, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. He made the choice to serve the Lord. And we can turn to the New Testament as well. In Acts chapter 2 and verse 21. There on the sermon that Peter preached on the first day of Pentecost, he was quoting from the prophet Joel. And in verse 21 of Acts chapter 2, he says, Whoever or whosoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Whosoever will can come. Whosoever calls upon the Lord, whoever makes a choice to follow God can certainly do that. That's the essence of Christianity. That is at the very heart of the gospel. That is the nature of the gospel, that we have the choice to decide whether or not to obey God. The entire book of the Old and New Testament would be irrelevant for our usage if that were not the case. So throughout the Word of God, we have these admonitions to make the right choice, implying that we have the right to make a choice, one way or the other. Just like Peter told Cornelius in Acts chapter 10, verse 34 and 35. He says, Then Peter opened his mouth and said, In truth I perceive that God shows no partiality, but in every nation, whoever fears him and works righteousness is accepted by him. So all people in the New Testament who came in contact with Jesus or the inspired apostles or even up to this day who read and study the New Testament are given the choice. It's the nature of the gospel. It's the nature of Christianity. It's the very heart of the gospel to have that choice to either obey or disobey. What a great privilege and honor it is that God gives us that power, that right, that opportunity to decide for ourselves. He treats us with respect in this gesture. 
He treats us with honor by giving the decision to us to examine our hearts, to decide what we want to do, and then to follow through with that based on our own decision. It's a very heavy proposition, very serious, because the eternal destination of our soul is a state. We'll either go to heaven to live eternally with God in eternal bliss, or we'll go into eternal damnation. So it's a very serious proposition, but he honors us by giving us the right and the opportunity to make the decision. And it's our prayer that we will all make the right decision to follow and obey God through his word. You know, as much a part of the gospel as that concept is, that man always has a choice in his relationship with God in reference to salvation, there are some religions who call themselves Christian who do not believe that. They do not teach that. Some religious systems teach that man does not have a choice with regard to his salvation. Whether he's going to obey God, whether he's going to do right or do wrong, go to heaven or hell, it is not up to mankind at all. He has no part to play in his eternal destination. Or whether he is right or wrong, a Christian or non-Christian, good or bad, evil or righteous. John Calvin is one who taught that. And Calvinism is a religious system that continues to teach that today. They say, as did John Calvin originally, that the choosing is all up to God. Only God and God alone decides who will be saved or lost. Mankind has no choice in the matter. They call this predestination. But it's not the same type of predestination that the Bible speaks of. The word predestination is used in Romans chapter 8, verse 29 and 30. But it's not the type of predestination that John Calvin is speaking of. A little history lesson, if you will, going back to the early 1500s. Back at that time, the Catholic Church was the primary religion in the world in terms of the number of people who were following uh, any type of religion, at least in the Western world. And at that time, the Catholic Church was involved with a system of indulgences. Indulgences were gifts or opportunities or permission that you could buy with a certain amount of money. For example, you might want to get permission to commit a certain sin that's really tempting you. Well, you can pay enough money to the Catholic Church, they'll give you the right, they'll give you an indulgence to commit that particular sin and get away with it. Or you might want to pay for some lost one to be saved, or pay for some departed loved one to spend less time in purgatory, which is another false doctrine that they teach. And so the Catholic Church would sell you these indulgences and give you those spiritual blessings for a certain amount of money. In other words, it was a system of buying salvation with money and with whatever works of obedience to the Catholic Church and their doctrine of indulgences that you chose to obey, or that they expected you or told you to obey and receive a certain spiritual blessing. Well, there were some objections to that, primarily on the part of one named Martin Luther. He thought this system of indulgences was completely unbiblical. And he set about the purpose of changing that. And he did, very drastically and permanently. He said that buying salvation through works and money is not scriptural, that man is saved by faith and faith alone, and all these works amount to nothing. The system of indulgences in order to gain salvation is not right, it's unscriptural, it's wrong, and he taught against it. But unfortunately, Martin Luther went to the other extreme. The Catholics on one hand saying that every spiritual blessing you can think of will give it to you for a certain amount of money or certain works and service to the Catholic Church. And Martin Luther came up with the idea that you don't have to do anything except believe. If you just have faith, that's all that it takes. And you can be saved. So he went to the opposite extreme. So what we ended up with was two primary religions, Catholicism and Protestantism. The very name Protestant came from the fact that Martin Luther protested against this system of indulgences and brought in his doctrine of faith only. That was in protest in the Catholic Church. 
So you had two large religions, Catholicism and Protestantism, that began after Martin Luther objected to the practices of the Catholic Church. Then entered John Calvin. He was contemporary with Martin Luther. John Calvin went even further than Martin Luther in terms of what a person needs to do to be saved, whereas Martin Luther said man must have faith, John Calvin said man does not even have to have faith. As a matter of fact, man cannot have faith. It's all up to God. God does everything. Salvation is God's choice and God's choice alone. Nothing at all is required of man or expected of man or is even possible of man in terms of showing obedience to God or any trait of Christianity or Christ-like attitude. He said by grace alone, grace only. That's an extreme position. It eliminated the need for even faith as Martin Luther taught. John Calvin taught that before creation, God decided who was going to be saved and who was not going to be saved. And nothing man could do could change that. There was nothing we could do about it at all. We could not change God's decision. We could not change our eternal destiny as God had decreed before the foundation of the world. So Calvin denied any possibility of man having any choice whatsoever in his salvation. Let me read a few quotes from the primary text of Calvinism from the Westminster Confession of Faith, chapter 3, paragraph 3, 4, and 5. Paragraph 3, the Westminster Confession of Faith. By the decree of God, for the manifestation of His glory, some men and angels are predestined unto everlasting life, and others foreordained to everlasting death. Paragraph 4. These angels and men, thus predestined and foreordained, are particularly and unchangeably designed. And their number is so certain and definite that it cannot be either increased or diminished. Nothing this side of God in heaven can change our eternal destination as God has decreed before even the foundation of the world. With regard to angels or men, God predestined for a day, unchangeably designed. That this number that he decreed to be saved was not going to be changed, it was certain and definite, and those who were going to be lost. That number could not be changed either. It cannot be increased, it cannot be diminished. He goes on further to say in paragraph 5, of the Westminster Confession of Faith, chapter 3, those of mankind who are predestined unto life, God before the foundation of the world was laid, according to his eternal and immutable purpose, and the secret counsel and good pleasure of his will, hath chosen in Christ unto everlasting glory, and out of his mere free grace and love, you might say, so far, that's just repetition of what he's already said in paragraphs uh, 3 and 4. But if somebody reading what we're saying about Calvinism might say, well, you've gone a little bit too far in condemning Calvinism. Because God certainly had foreknowledge and foresight into what man was going to do in the future. And he simply based his decision as to who's going to be saved and who's lost on what mankind individually will do whether they will obey or disobey. So you give a little credit to mankind and take a little bit of God's total control in this matter away from Him by saying that God's foreordination, God's predestination, God's foreknowledge and foresight was based on what man would eventually do. Each individual would obey, some would disobey. He knew that, so they he based their ultimate salvation or lack of salvation upon decisions they would make. But read what the rest of this paragraph says. He says, without any foresight of faith or good works or perseverance of either of them or anything in the creature as conditions or causes moving him thereunto and all to the praise of his glorious grace. Let me read that again. Here, 
The last part of that paragraph 5 points out that there was nothing that man could do to change his eternal nation, uh, destiny, that God chose it before the foundation of the world, and God was not using his foresight into what man and his decisions might be in the future. It was simply based upon his unchangeable decree from the beginning. It had nothing to do with a man obeying God or disobeying God. Let me read the whole paragraph again. Those of mankind that are predestined into life. God before the foundation of the world was laid, according to his eternal and immutable purpose, and the secret counsel and good pleasure of his will, hath chosen in Christ unto everlasting glory, out of his mere free grace and love, without any foresight of faith or good works, or perseverance in either of them, or any other thing in the creature as conditions or causes moving him thereunto, and all to the praise of his glorious grace. So he mistakenly believed that this was to God's glory. This is to God's praise. To come up with a doctrine that's totally antithetical to the Word of God. Things that are taught in both the Old and the New Testament. That is, a man has a choice in salvation. That's part of the very essence of Christianity. It's the nature of Christianity. It's at the heart of God's dealings with mankind. That whether in the Old or the New Testament, mankind has a right to make a decision. They have a choice to play in this matter. You know, I think we can see some contradictions in this doctrine. If God is in control of everything, if He unchangeably put everything in motion that exists, would that not also include Satan? Would that not also include sin and temptation to sin? I think we can see a contradiction. Going back into chapter 3 and paragraph 1, which I haven't read yet of this Westminster Confession of Faith, verse 1 says, God from all eternity did, by the most wise and holy counsel of his own will, freely and unchangeably ordain whatever comes to pass. That's what they said. This is the words of John Calvin. That God from all eternity did by the most wise and holy counsel of his own will, freely and unchangeably ordain whatever comes to pass. Whatever comes to pass is God's unchangeable ordination. Yet so, as thereby neither is God the author of sin, nor is violence offered to the will of the creatures. That's a contradiction right there in that first paragraph. That God by his holy counsel and wise counsel, his own will free and unchangeably ordained whatsoever comes to pass. Would that not include temptation and sin and every evil thing in the world that's come to pass? If there's anything, any single thing that happens on the face of this earth that God did not do, then John Calvin says God must not be in control. God will not be in control. If anything, took place on this earth that God did not unchangeably decree to take place. So I think we can see a contradiction that God would have had to have created sin and unchangeably decree that sin take place. Just like he says here, God from all eternity did by the most wise and holy counsel of his own will, freely and unchangeably ordain whatsoever comes to pass, yet so, as thereby neither is God the author of sin. I think that's a contradiction. It's pretty obvious in the Westminster Confession of Faith of John Calvin that many people still follow today. Now, not every person that considers himself Calvinist follows every dictator of Calvinism, of the Calvinistic system. But many of them still do, and that doctrine is still alive and well. Well, let's ask the question, what's behind all of this? What's behind John Calvin's efforts to put everything under God's total and complete control? That nothing happens, no decision can be made by mankind that wasn't made by God. I think it is God's sovereignty. 
If anything happens in the world, as I stated, that God did not cause, the Calvinism teaches that God is not sovereign, that God is really not in control. So everything that happens has to be attributed to and only to God. Otherwise, they say God is not sovereign and God is not in control. And that is quite extreme. And I think we can see the contradiction in that from what we read there in paragraph 1 of this Westminster Confession of Faith. So God must have unchangeably ordained and designed sin if what John Calvin says is true. But there's another aspect of Calvinism I'd like to spend a few minutes on before we bring our lesson to a close. And that has to do with the concept of TULIP. T-U-L-I-P. This is an acronym that stands for several doctrines of the uh, Calvinist system. Total depravity, unconditional election, limited atonement, irresistible grace, and the perseverance of the faith of the, of the saints. Let's take a look at them one at a time. The idea of total hereditary depravity, which the T stands for in the system of Calvinism, means that all men and women are born sinners and are totally incapable of doing anything good. Totally incapable of doing anything good. The U stands, as I mentioned, for unconditional election. That God has unconditionally elected those who are going to be saved and those who are going to be lost. And man has passed it, been that decision. You can do nothing about it one way or another. That mankind has been unconditionally, on his part, no conditions could be met for his salvation or his loss. God decides. Limited atonement teaches that Christ died only for the chosen. Calvin certainly believes that people are going to be saved through Jesus as part of God's plan. He acknowledges, but uh, Christ only died for those who were chosen by God to be saved. Irresistible grace. The doctrine of Calvinism that teaches that man cannot resist God's grace for salvation, or he cannot overcome God's decision that he be lost eternally. Nothing we can do. We cannot stand against God's grace. It's irresistible. We cannot say no to God's grace. Perseverance of the saints teaches that those who are chosen by God cannot fall. So total heredity, hereditary depravity, unconditional election, limited atonement, Irresistible grace, the perseverance of the saints. These are all part and parcel, the essence of John Calvin's doctrine of grace only. That God is in total control, God is sovereign. Everything that happens is up to God. Man has no choice whatsoever in his salvation. It's all up to God. But let's very quickly turn to a few passages in the Word of God that stand opposed to these Calvinistic points. First of all, the idea of total hereditary depravity. If you would turn to Exodus chapter 18, Ezekiel rather, Ezekiel chapter 18, and read some words I'm sure that we're all familiar with as well. Ezekiel 18, and verse 20, the soul who sins shall die. The son shall not bear the guilt of the father, nor the father bear the guilt of the son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon himself, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon himself. That's the principle that every man is going to be judged based on his own work, his own decision either to obey or disobey, and it is a personal, individual judgment that God renders based upon the decision that we make. I'm not going to be judged based upon the sins or lack thereof of my father. My son, my daughter will not be judged upon my sins. Their children will not be judged upon their sins. We all stand before God individually to face judgment. 
That's reflected in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 10 in that judgment scene that we will all stand before the judgment seat of God to give an account for what we've done in this, on this earth, whether good or bad. So this idea of total hereditary depravity is not scriptural. And there's many other passages as well that we can list that uh, would make the same point both from the old as well as the New Testament. But let's move on then to the next Calvinistic tenet, that is unconditional election. That God chooses and man is passive. Man has nothing to do with his salvation. We're familiar with Matthew chapter 7 and verse 21, which says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? Then I would declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Everyone might say, Lord, Lord, but the only ones who are going to be saved are those who make the decision and follow through with their obedience, who do the will of my Father in heaven. Our eternal destination is based on our decision to either obey or disobey God. This idea of unconditional election that John Calvin teaches is not scriptural, it's not true. Our decisions are important. Our decision means something to God. He bases his final judgment of our soul based upon the decisions that we've made in life. We go grow up knowing that our decisions are important. Whether we obey our parents or not, if we disobey, we're punished. If we obey, then we're better off for it. And the family is going on the way it should if we disobey the laws of the land. I remember hearing a story about a Calvinistic driver who was driving 60 miles an hour in a 40 mile per hour zone. He was pulled over by a police officer. And when he pulled, when the police officer stepped up to the window, the, said, and the man said, Officer, I'm a Calvinist. And I may have been driving 60 miles per hour in a 40 zone, but it was God that did it, not me. So I'm not at fault. This is God's doing. And about that time, the police officer shook his hand and said, Brother, I'm glad to meet you because I'm a Calvinist too. And God told me that I'm going to give you a ticket today and there's nothing that can change that. So, that might be a, the lighter side of the contradictions of Calvinism. But whether we go to heaven or hell, whether we're obedient to God or not, depends upon our decision. Our decisions, our choices are important in the plan of salvation. We take a look now at the idea of limited atonement, that Christ died only for the chosen. Uh, we could all think probably of a number of scriptures that would contradict this over in 1 John chapter 2 and verse 2. 1 John chapter 2 and the second verse. Beginning in verse 1, my little children, these things are right to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, and he himself is a propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but for the whole world. Jesus died for the whole world. He shed his blood for the whole world, not just the righteous, but every sinner in the world. That's on their way to eternal damnation, they have the right to change, and Christ's blood will save them from their sins. It was shed for them as well. Everyone has a right to the tree of life if they will come to him. Whosoever will, whosoever comes, whosoever will confess Christ can be saved. So this idea of limited atonement is no more truthful than the other tenets of Calvinism. Irresistible grace, Joshua 24 verse 15, that man uh, cannot uh, resist God's grace. Well, back in Joshua 24, verse 15 to 16, we read there about Joshua. He had the choice to make. He could either resist God's offer of salvation, God's offer of guiding him as a leader of God's people. He could either reject it or accept it. And he puts the same proposition in the lap of the nation of Israel. You can resist doing good. You can resist salvation. You can resist righteousness. It's your decision. You can either accept 
God's commands and be obedient to them, or you can reject them. It's up to you. Joshua recognized that he put the idea of that you have to make a decision. You're like I've made a decision. Me and my house, we will serve the Lord. You make that same decision. It's your right. It's your responsibility. God expects you to make a decision. And he will judge you based upon whatever decision you make. But then finally, the idea of the per perseverance of the saints. That is, once saved, always saved. This is what that means. Galatians chapter 5 and verse 4 does not teach that. Galatians chapter 5 and 4 says, You have become estranged from Christ. He's talking to Christians here. You have become estranged from Christ. You who attempt to be justified by the law, you have fallen from grace. You have fallen from grace. That as you were in grace, you were saved. You accepted God's grace. But now you're going back into the law of Moses, seeking salvation. But you can't do that. There's no salvation in the law. So once you are saved, you can be lost if you so choose. A person can sin as to be lost after he's become a Christian based upon his decision in the same way that becoming a Christian in the first place was his decision. You can change that decision. You can abort your uh, track your, uh, uh, into eternal salvation by choosing to disobey God. So in conclusion, let me point out that these passages strike right at the very heart of Calvinism. They strike right at the very heart of the idea that mankind cannot have a choice in this salvation. We must be obedient to God. So now at the end of our lesson, we're going to be right back where we started in reference to this part that choice plays in whether or not we're saved. We have a choice. God has always given man a choice. That choice was here yesterday. That choice is here today. And that choice for you will be here tomorrow. If you're still here tomorrow. But you may not be here tomorrow. We don't really know whether we'll be here tomorrow. The Word of God teaches us that today is the accepted day. Today is a day of salvation. If you're not saved, don't depend upon this doctrine of Calvinism, which is anti-scriptural, which is against what God teaches about the necessity of our own choices. Throw that away in the garbage can where it belongs. And you make a decision today, if you're not already a Christian, make a decision knowing that it's important and necessary that you decide to become a Christian. In a moment when we stand to sing the song of invitation, you have an opportunity to walk down the aisle, Confess your sins, confess Jesus, repent of your sins, confess Jesus as your Savior, and be baptized into the body of Christ. If you're willing to do that, you know you need to, God will accept that as evidence of your obedience and your humility and your decision to follow Him. Today is accepted day. Let today be the day of your salvation as together we stand and as we sing.